I was just wondering that, like, how are you going to mount it in vacuum and expect that it has any reflection at all to how a board will actually be mounted in a real system? Yeah, well, that was the problem with all of this testing is that none of it seemed to simulate any real boards in any practice. And it just drove me crazy. It made no sense. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the On Track Podcast. I am Zach Peterson, your host, and today I'm going to be talking with Mike Jopi. Uh, He originally sat on one of the IPC task groups uh, working on standards for thermal management, and we're going to be talking about thermal management in PCBs today. should be an illuminating discussion, so let's get started. Hey, Mike, thank you so much for joining me, and uh, I'm really eager to hear what you have to say, especially since you originally sat on uh, one of the IPC task groups for this important topic. Thanks, Zach. Good morning. Good morning. I think before we get started, um, I always like to, to ask folks, uh, maybe tell me a little bit how you got involved in uh, PCB design and you know your background that led you to work uh, with the IPC. <laughs> yeah, well, I told you earlier, I got to be careful with story time. <laughs> uh, you know, Whatever you feel comfortable sharing, yeah, I'll just say that. Well, you know, it, out of high school, I, I enlisted in the Air Force. And I was a missile maintenance specialist on ICBMs. I met my wife in the Air Force, and we uh, moved to Tucson, Arizona after the Air Force went to school. I was able to get an internship with Hughes Aircraft after my junior year at the University of Arizona. And they started me doing thermal analysis on electronics. There were two options for me at the time. There were two jobs that they were looking for. One was to go catch tow missiles in the Yuma Desert, and one was to do thermal analysis, and fortunately, it was the thermal analysis. <laughs> it's funny how that works. You know, my, my background in, in lasers, they kind of gave me two options. It was electrochemical stuff or lasers, and so I picked the lasers. <laughs> yeah. You know, those sports in the road, you know, kind of dictate a lot. And, uh, yeah, I, I also, I just like doing projects. And, uh, you know, when things kind of turn up and work needs to be done. You know, I've got a mindset, you know, that's kind of in the TQM, the total quality management mindset. I like the constant improvement and the feedback. And so it was, uh, so I I had moved, my wife and I moved to uh, Colorado in 1996, and I was working for Lockheed Martin, and I was working on a, a spacecraft called Stardust. And I was working on the uh, electronics that was bringing the solar ray power in and charging the batteries on the spacecraft, as well as powering the electronics. And it was on that electronics that I was doing the thermal analysis where an electrical engineer had brought me power dissipations for the traces. And it was like 10 watts of power. Well, no, it was like a little over 8 watts of power. And we had 24 watts of power just from the components. And that additional power from the traces changed the design. So Now, th- this is, this is uh, power dissipated as heat, not just the power being carried. Yeah, it's, it's the joule, joule heating in the electrical traces. Uh, it's watts of power. And the electrical engineer, so this is 1997-ish, and... I started doing thermal analysis on that internship in 1982. Now we're in 1997, and it's the first time that anyone had given me power for the traces before. And uh, I had been asked by electrical engineers in previous years, you know, when I first started, about the power losses in the traces. And I talked to the people that were mentoring me back then, and they said that the power was negligible. Well, here we are in 1997, and they were not negligible at all, and it changed the design. So I asked the electrical engineer, his name was Rick Fern, uh, where he got these powers, and he showed me this IPC document that uh, was just being converted from a mill standard document. I think it was mill standard 275, and it was turning into IPC D275, which later turned into IPC 2221, which most people now are more familiar with. And 
in the that document, it showed these nomographs for sizing electrical traces. And he said, you know, he picked those and then he calculated the power based on the size of the traces. And in that document, it also said that you should take, if you're working in a space environment, that you should take it into consideration. But it didn't tell you how. So here I am, I'm looking at this and I don't know what to do. And I, so I called IPC and uh, I, I got in touch with John Perry. And John had just started with IPC. And I asked him, you know, where these, these charts came from and, and how to take a vacuum environment into consideration. And he said he didn't know. And he didn't know where the data came from. And so uh, he went off to do some research and he, he came back to me and he said that he thought, the people at IPC thought that the original information came from a, a IPC technical paper, uh, IPC TM117. And it was written by a Dr. Jennings at Sandia Labs. And it turned out that wasn't the right paper, but it had and it wasn't right because he had done all his testing for 30 seconds. He'd, he'd power up a trace for 30 seconds, and that's not enough time to reach steady state. And so it, it just wasn't the right answer. And so I put in, I was working at Lockheed, and I uh, requested some internal research and development money to go off and do some testing to understand uh, more about the trace heating. And I, I got funding for it, and I you know, went through a year of testing we tested in air and in vacuum and uh, right when and I submitted that paper to IPC and right when I was getting ready to go out for the conference I found a document that told me how to do the testing and that's an IPC uh, document also in their test methods and it's uh, a IPC uh, test document it's 2.5.4.1 a and in there, it showed a totally different board configuration. And I was freaking out. You know, here I am going to a conference, talk about my results, and, and then I find a whole different setup. And so I, I went to the conference, I presented, and uh, at the time, uh, there's a guy by the name of Ralph Hersey who was heading up the task group, the IPC task group for these nomographs. And he was saying that my test results showed that it, it validated the existing uh, test data and the charts that were in the old uh, uh, mill standards in this IPC document. And I raised my hand and I, I said, no, I don't think it does. You know, these internal traces are not similar at all. And uh, so I, I left. And I went back and I asked for some more money from our internal research and development group. And they funded me again and I built boards just like, you know, this test method. And so we did more testing. We tested in air and in vacuum again. And they were a little bit different uh, in this test method. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to be doing a... Uh, another presentation and I'll go into more detail about those kind of things but so long story short I did more testing and finished that up and wrote another paper and presented that and that turned into uh, a lot it, it was much better results it followed the, the test methods and again the internal trace temperatures were very different than what were in the existing standard and uh, as a result of that, I ended up volunteering to lead this new task group and start doing more work on it. So uh, I went back to Lockheed and uh, I asked for more money. <laughs> <laughs> and they turned me down. It's the life of a researcher, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. You know, just, there was so much more work to do because the testing we were doing, it didn't have any copper planes in the board. And the copper planes I knew would have a significant effect. And we also weren't mounting the, you know, the, the test method has you suspending the, the board in, in air or in vacuum. 
And all of my boards were mounted in these aluminum chassis and with wedge locks. And I wanted to work all of that in. Um, well, and I was just I was just wondering that, like, how are you going to mount it in vacuum and expect that it has any reflection at all to how a board will actually be mounted in a real system? Yeah, well, that was the problem with all of this testing is that none of it seemed to simulate any real boards in any practice. And it just drove me crazy. It made no sense to to go that way. And I just kept doing, you know, more work. But uh, <clears throat> So Lockheed didn't want to continue the work, so I quit. I, I called the University, I called the University of Colorado in Denver, talked to the mechanical engineering lab and the, uh, or the mechanical engineering department. I talked to the head and I told them that I wanted to uh, continue to do research on this whole traced heating thing. And he offered me a position, I created a class uh, and then we, teamed up. There were three other professors and we wrote a National Science Foundation grant proposal to uh, fund continuing to do the work. So it took us about six months to write that proposal. Uh, and <laughs> we even went out to DC, talked to the National Science Foundation. After submitting it, they turned it down. They didn't fund it. They said the work had already been done, but obviously they didn't read our proposal because we explained what the state of the art was and they, they didn't get it. And it. The excuse I heard was, you know, it just wasn't cool enough for them to fund it. <laughs> so they offered me a PhD position to go and continue my education. I had two kids and uh, I couldn't afford to live on a, a stipend and, and keep doing the research at the university. So. I bought all of the equipment that we had set up for the lab and I set up a lab in my basement. I hired two of the student engineers that I was working with and I started my own little company and we started collecting all the data. The cool thing was that Lockheed, uh, when I went over to the university, Lockheed donated all of the equipment that we had, all the boards to the university. And there were a couple other companies, was, uh, another Lockheed facility down in Texas that built some other FR4 boards for us. And, you know, we had all of this equipment ready to do all the testing at the university. So I purchased all of that from the university, set up the lab and continued to do the testing. And so, so the, the real quick, the, the boards that you're testing, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you're going kind of off on your own in terms of the testing method, it's since you've essentially discovered that the testing method doesn't really validate anything that is happening in uh, in a real system, and then varying all the parameters in the board. So, you know, uh, the thickness, uh, how big is the board, where is the copper located, is there any copper, I mean, things like that. So the, the real catch with this kind of testing is that uh, it takes a long time to go through and power up each trace, run it to steady state at each amp you know, setting and collect enough data to be able to put these charts together. And so the process that I developed was to uh, collect real data on uh, these boards. So I had FR4 boards and polyimid boards, two different thicknesses of FR4 and you know one thickness of Poly -imid. And what we did was the whole concept was to collect the data, real data with, you know, controlled environment and known variables, and then use that to create a thermal model and correlate the thermal model to the data, and then use the thermal models to then start adding variables and change variables. So I was then able to start adding copper planes. Uh, I never got to the point of adding uh, wedge locks to it, but that was in the game plan. Uh, we ended up developing about 68 different charts. Uh, 13 of those were raw data, and then the remaining ones were all analytical creations, you know, with the thermal models. And it, they, it's just really cool to see the results from each one of them, because as we varied the board thickness, 
Uh, as you get thinner, the temperatures go up. As you get you make your board smaller, the temperature goes up. Um, and that's that's just because when you make the board smaller and you make it thinner, there's just less thermal mass in the substrate to accept all that heat that you're generating from the trace. Well, not so much just accepting it, but how it's conducting through it. You know, you're minimizing sure, sure. the heat transfer path, and then you have less surface area for it to because suspended in air or suspended in vacuum suspended in air you only have natural con in way we test is in still air so it's just natural convection from the surfaces to the air and and as well as radiation losses and for low delta t's the radiation losses are almost negligible but when you start getting up into the you know 100 degrees c delta t's then the radiation is is real noticeable you can see uh variations there and uh you know so we, we started collecting all this data and then i reached out to a software company and i was able to talk them into teaming with me and we created a software tool to use to take all this data in because so this is in the time frame of 2002 to 2004 and so we developed a software program uh, had it for sale online. We had a version that you could just download and use, and we had a server version where multiple people could use it in a corporation setting. Uh, it was it was really cool, and I liked it a lot. But I just couldn't get it going in terms of a, a tool. And I had a small window of opportunity to go back to Lockheed uh, to where I could pick up a pension again. And so my window of opportunity as an entrepreneur ended in 2004. We didn't have enough sales with the software, so I had to shut everything down and put it away. And uh, then I just went back to work at Lockheed as a thermal analyst, and I continued to work with the IPC task group to you know, create a new document and try to get some of the data into that document, as well as... So that was... That was the IPC 2152 standard. Yeah, so we hadn't created it yet. That came out in 2009. So okay. you know, I, I did all this work up until 2004, then I had to archive it all. I couldn't run a business and work at Lockheed uh, as an engineer. You gotta do one or the other, and so I had to put it away. But I kept the intellectual property and maintained that, which you know was a mixed blessing there. Uh, kind of prevented me from sharing a lot of the research that I'd done with the people around me at Lockheed. Uh, so that was a bummer. But I, I continued to work with IPC, uh, you know, and keep in mind that all the work with IPC is as a volunteer. So you're just giving your time and giving everything to them. And so we continued on, on the path with IPC 2152. Uh, I started working with IPC in 1999. I sat down with this guy, Dieter Bergman, and we created a 10-year plan. And uh, it was about 2004 or 2005. Do you know Happy Holden? Hap Holden? Does that ring a bell for you? Yeah. Yeah, I do. So Hap called me up and he said, how about writing a chapter for the Print Circuits Handbook? Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Uh, I've heard of it. Yeah, I've never read it. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's one reason why. <laughs> yeah, so I wrote a chapter in there. I thought that would be a good way to get a, a foundation for what we could put into this new document 2152. And so I wrote that chapter, and then I brought that to the task group. And then as a group, which <laughs> nice way to write, you know, by committee, uh, we Mm -hmm. just kind of just broke it all apart and then assembled it into what became IPC 2152, which then got published in 2009. And uh, the reason that I, I contacted you and wanted to you know, have this discussion is because I was going out on the net and <clears throat> I was seeing a lot of confusion over what IPC 2221 and 2152 really represent. People were just confused about it. You know, they just don't really get it. 
Um, well, is it is it confusion over how to use the the documentation in those standards, or is it confusion over what physically those that documentation is supposed to reflect? I think it's both. Or is it both? I think it's both. That's, that's what I thought, too. Yeah. I mean, if you go... Yeah, be, well, because sometimes I'll see questions on forums, and someone will ask, how do I how do I calculate the maximum current I should put into this trace or into this plane or something like this, you know, and there are some, there are some, uh, empirical equations and then there's also the standards. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, back to those equations, we talked about this the other day and I don't want to forget to bring this up. Uh, all the equations for the charts in IPC 2152 are in a couple of papers that I wrote and, I'm going to put those on my website and it's, it's easy to find. We'll, and we'll link to that in the show. Yeah. Notes. It's, it's, yeah. it's thermalman.com. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thermalman.com. Yeah. And all one word thermalman, which was a nickname I picked up. At, I was working in Alabama on the space station and this is definitely one of those tangents, so I'm, I, but it's a good story. I want to share it. So I, All right. <laughs> I, was, I was driving to work one day and I was listening to NPR and it was George Bush, H.W., was president at the time. And he asked professionals to go out and start getting involved with high schools and students to help them, you know, getting professionals to work with students to help them get going and get motivated, and, you know, for school and other things. And so I took that to heart and I went to a local high school. And I uh, recruited a dozen students to work with me on a project. And what we were going to do is measure the thermal properties of an egg. And I, I went. Okay. And I went to the University of Alabama, talked to the mechanical engineering department. They gave me keys to their heat transfer lab, and said you can use all the equipment. So we would go in on Friday afternoons after they got out of school, and Saturday mornings. We mounted thermal couples in eggs, hard boiled them, collected the time temperature data, created a thermal model of the egg, correlated the model, and wrote a technical paper and presented it at a conference in Huntsville. The the cool thing was, well, first off, all those students had papers, but you know, graduating high school that were published, and there was a guy in the audience that had just come back from the Galapagos Islands. And they were trying to recover some uh, rare turtle eggs. And they, the eggs spoiled on the way back, transporting them. And he asked if, if we could possibly use this thermal model to help them predict the temperatures and control the environment for these eggs. And I said, well, yeah, this would work cool for that. And so he suggested writing to the National Science Foundation to uh, go and do some research like that but I never did it. So if anybody ever watches this that knows it, if you need some help on turtle eggs, call me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so back on topic, that... back on topic. <laughs> so continue to do a bunch of research on, you know, the trace heating and, uh, you know, we, in the task group, we had a, a list of all these things that we wanted to characterize. My view toward IPC 2152 is that it's a foundation for building a thermal model. It's all about computer modeling. All the information's there that gives you very detailed parameters on all the variables. The only thing that I didn't include was, uh, I, I included the emissivity of the surface, but I didn't include the convective environment, but it's just a natural convective environment. Uh, you know, any standard heat transfer book has it. And so it's really easy. All the information's in that document to model. And then from there, you can uh, add things to that model to help you predict, you know, what the real temperatures are. And that was the path I took. So as a part of the task group, the things that we wanted to look at were not just conductors and rigid boards, but we wanted to look at flex. We wanted to look at you know, the heating in vias and microvias, uh, the neck down areas. Uh, we wanted to look at high current. So well, one of the troubles with the work I was doing was limited to about 25 amps with my power supply. It would have been nice to go higher and bigger conductors. Um, 
just to let people know, we we did a lot of work with other, I got some people to do other testing. Uh, there was a, a classified lab in Minnesota that did some work. They were into real high speed and they were running into issues. They repeated the same testing with the same kind of boards that uh, I was doing. They compared real well. What was interesting is that we could tell a small difference between the testing I was doing, which is you know at 5,000 feet here in Denver, versus sea level, uh, roughly sea level in Minnesota, where these other guys were doing their testing. And that I could imagine that's that's important if you're in an aircraft and you're at 30,000 feet. Yeah, and there we got some t work done at Navsi Crane also, where we did some work in. Uh, in an altitude chamber, and we were able mm -hmm. to collect data there. Uh, and yeah, you know, altitude. Uh, so, you know, we collected all of that, and it's hard to compress all of that and put it into a single document, right? And the document. And I was going to say, I was going to bring that up because if you actually look at like the, the standard nomograph that's in, you know, IPC 2152, what do you see? You see copper weight, you see preferred temperature rise, and then conductor cross section, and that's essentially it. Yeah. But there, there, it's. I mean, there are so many more variables, and I think at at some point it becomes really difficult to compile all of that into one standard because isn't the goal of the standard to just r make it really easy for a designer to get the information they need and move on and do what they do best, which is design. Yeah, but I think, you know, the hard part was that we couldn't just test all these different configurations, right? And it just took too long. It was just not possible. It just wasn't feasible. And that's where, you know, the concept of creating the thermal model and the standard allows you, it gives you all of very, very, very good detail about the variables that would impact a very simple model suspended in air. And now it's up to other users to expand on that, All right? So, so I, I, I take it that eventually what you, you find is that the, the specifications in that standard don't give you something that's actually accurate. Well, it's very accurate for what it represents. So, right, for that, one, for that one case. But if you expand that out and try and extrapolate to you know, a general case for any other board... You're going to see. A I can immediately see that the results aren't accurate. Well, no, because they aren't. That, you're not comparing apples and apples. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you know, one of the re so, as a part of all of this work, I, I ended up finding the original data to the charts that are in IPC 2221, and that was all documented in the National Bureau of Standards report from 1955 ish, and those guys. They tested, you know, back then they only had two-sided boards and they tested boards of different thickness and, and they tested uh, different copper weights. Some of the boards had copper planes on the back of them. Uh, they uh, had varying board thicknesses, copper planes, trace thickness. Oh, and the materials were phenolic and epoxy. And so, and then they put all of those data points on these charts and then back then they didn't have things like Excel. So they took a French curve and wrote, drove best line through all those data points. And so the external trace chart in IPC 2221 represents that data. And so when you look at the external data from IPC 2221 and you compare the external data from IPC 2152, you'll see that IPC 2152 is a little more conservative because it does, it's not influenced by copper planes and all of these other data points. Sure, so when you have the copper plane on the backside of the trace, obviously copper is a heat conductor. It's gonna take whatever heat does dissipate into the substrate, spread it around. Yes. And then ultimately give you that more even temperature distribution. Yep, yeah, it has. This, you know, th this is kind of funny because uh, there are certain more experienced designers than myself uh, who are well known, who have said that uh, things like copper planes and copper pour do absolutely nothing for thermal management. And you're saying that they're wrong and you have the data to prove it. Big time. 
<laughs> Big time. Well, copper is a thousand times more thermally conductive than the dielectric material. Well, of course. Well, yeah. How can it not impact the trace temperature rise? Well, that, that's what makes me wonder why somebody would say that whether it's copper poor or copper plain, whatever it may be, that it doesn't do anything for thermal management. I'm, I'm wondering if now they're saying, well, it's this one specific type of board or it's, you know, you have to put an asterisk next to that. It's only when the board is small, whereas you're talking more in a plurality of situations and in general it should. Yeah, yeah, the copper planes. And when I, whenever I was designing uh, part of the design teams for uh, any circuit board design, uh, I would ask the electrical engineers to give me power dissipations for the traces, and I would lay that out on the board. I'd have all the power for my components. I'd lay that out on the board. <clears throat> In my, pre I'd do preliminary analysis, just placement by putting surface heat on the boards with the trace heating as well as the, the component heating. And if things are too hot, I just add copper planes or thicken the copper planes that are near the sources. And that's, that's the simplest way to bring the temperatures down and then tie that copper to my main sink. So I'd run it out to my wedge locks where I'm, I'm bolted into an aluminum chassis and I dump all the energy out there. And so, yeah, and, and then thermal vias, you know, tie those copper planes together and, and get that. All you're doing is trying to create a heat transfer path around that dielectric material and get the energy out of the board. Makes perfect sense. And you're tying the, the planes that you're taking advantage of for heat sinking, you're tying them directly into the chassis. So that makes perfect sense. Yeah, and we ran into some issues with that. And I, I've run some studies where, you know, a five mil dielectric spacing between uh, a plane and another plane, you almost don't see much of a gradient if, if you have just a five mil spacing. If you have a quarter inch spacing, it's almost like being completely isolated. But you bring those planes together. So if there was ever a problem with the planes, you know, if you had power or ground and you didn't want to dump to chassis, you just kept the uh, dielectric spacing very narrow between that heat transfer path and you're still dumping a lot of heat out. So yeah, run my copper planes out and then thermal vias through the wedge locks and that would be my standard process. Yeah, and I, I think now I might be seeing where the copper pour versus a plane could provide a difference in heat transfer characteristics because you would then have to have, if you want to take advantage of say copper pour as a thermal, you know, thermal management element, you would then have to tie it back to the plane essentially everywhere with stitching vias. Yeah. Well, it depends on what the pores are like. You know, if it's a small, you know, I've seen these 10th inch square patterns, you know, 10, like 10 mils by 10, 100 mils by 100 mils little squares cover a whole surface. You know, those aren't doing a lot for you. I mean, it sure is going to make sure. a difference, but it's the the filled copper areas uh, that make the big difference. And I've run studies, you know, running traces over areas with and without copper. And well, you see a big difference, you know, where it's close and where it's not. And, you know, the temperature going up where you don't have the copper and you, you can see the gradients. They become very apparent and uh, pretty obvious that copper's doing the job for you. Yeah, I think in, intuitively that makes sense. And then also you mentioned the dielectric spacing, but then also the, the dielectric uh, properties, like the resin content, should also have an influence. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that uh, when we've started doing this work uh, with the trace testing, I was able to send board samples for all of our boards to a company that uh, measured the thermal conductivity in the X, Y, and Z plane, as well as measured the specific heat and density for us, which are important for the transient side, the t you know, time temperature uh, response. And what was interesting is that you know, in most of the uh, literature for dielectric materials, they only give you the Z axis thermal conductivity, the through plane, which is really the epoxy. And 
in, in the XY plane, where you've got fibers running through, you actually see an impact from the fibers, and there's an increase in the thermal conductivity in the XY plane it, that's probably double what it is the Z axis. And that was a big deal for us for correlating the models to the data. We needed, you know, very, we, we wanted to have the best information on all the variables that we were using in the model to uh, get a correlation. You know, with any kind of modeling, garbage in, garbage out. And the only way to get a good correlation was having known properties for everything that we were running in the model. And the only thing that, you know, we didn't measure was the emissivity of the surface. But I've got a lot of experience with that, with other work I've done, and so it all panned out pretty well. I, yeah, I, I think what I'm really hearing here is that you would use the term uh, conservative in term to describe the estimates uh, from IPC 2152, right? So they're essentially telling you to overestimate the um, the amount or the width of copper that you would need to limit a temperature rise. And so for your particular board, you really do have to do quite a bit of testing just to ensure that you are going to be below your temperature limits. And I'm sure this is also going to depend on factors like, um, let's say you have a large IC, it's got multiple power rails coming to it. Those power rails could also be heat dissipators. And so there are so many different variables that it's, it's almost impossible to, not impossible, but it's an intractable problem to really compile all of these variables into one standard. Yeah, it is next to impossible. But what I was doing, what I found is, you know, some of the major players in terms of the temperature response of the trace were the influence of the copper planes. And then from other work I've done, your mounting configuration, whether it's wedge locks or bolted interfaces, those are huge also. They take as, they depend, and, and so you can't just incorporate. So I designed a lot of six by eight boards with wedge locks. Well, I could have created a standard for my, you know, and 18 to 24 layer boards of two ounce copper, right? So that wouldn't do anybody. It's a lot of copper. It's a boatload of copper. <laughs> we had high power and yeah, and our, our applications, you can't go fix them when they're heading to Jupiter, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, how do you, uh, you know, do I do I create a standard just for me? Well, that didn't make any sense, right? And how do I assume what everybody else is doing? Can't do that either. So we and you know, it's, it's there. So I'm not the task group chairman anymore. I left. If you want to go help those guys, <laughs> I could I could set you up. <laughs> There, there's uh, well, I'm, I'm already involved in, in another organization and I had to step down from one standards group because I just, I don't have time to do it anymore. I know, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. God, uh, you know, heaven, heaven bless those guys who are, uh, or who, those people, I should say, who, who have the time and the willingness to participate in these groups because uh, they're, I know they're doing a lot for the industry. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to come out and talk about these standards a little bit to help clear the air a little bit about what they are and what they represent. And you know, you can't expect it to meet the need for everybody, but it's, <laughs> but you don't want to ha cause someone to fail either, right? And and so yeah, well, well and and so the the twenty one fifty two standard. I mean, was that originally developed with the intention of providing a conservative estimate, or is that just kind of how it ended up? Uh, well, it was just, it, it's kind of how it ended up, but it was following what had been done before. Okay. Okay. So no one really thought that it was broken. They just did what was in the test method. We followed the test method, which was the right thing to do. And okay. I tried to expand that by using 2152. I called 2152 a baseline. Just a baseline. Sure. And then you, from your baseline, you develop from there. Sure, yeah. And the hardest thing is getting a correlated model. Because, you know, for the same cross-sectional area, you get a different delta T 
if it's half ounce, one ounce, two ounce, or three ounce, or four ounce copper. Same process yeah. and area. Different. Blocks. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that makes perfect sense. Oh, well, that's not obvious to everybody, though. <laughs> well, I, okay, I, I, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, same cross-sectional area, but different weight. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's all about the perimeter and the exposed surface area of that conductor. As you get thicker, the perimeter gets smaller, mm -hmm. and you don't, you're not dumping as much energy. And as you flatten it out, you have more surface area, bigger perimeter. And, and, so, and you see that in the data. So that was really cool. I mean, was, we got to see a lot of those things, and that's what became important to replace IPC twenty, you know, the charts in twenty two twenty one, because that was just this hodgepodge of a bunch of data. And then when we went to uh, multi layer boards, instead of running more tests and collecting internal trace data, all they did was go to halving the current. And so if you look at the equations that describe the charts in 2221, you'll see a 0.5 factor on the beginning of the equation, and it's just half the current from the external conductors. Is the just, I think the justification for that is then that the, the exposed surface on the surface layer, right, that top surface, you're just regarding it as being a perfect insulator. And so then once you go into the internal trace, it's essentially having double the, the, the conductive area to remove heat. Well, they were saying the thought process but they were saying it? it was going to be hotter internal. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. So they okay. were saying you could have only half the current. Yes, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. They got it backwards. Well, it, yeah, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, it's real apparent when you look at the data that we've collected for 2152. And it makes sense also because the thermal conductivity of the dielectric material is still better than the thermal conductivity of air and a natural conductive environment. Now, if you start blowing air over the traces or you, uh, you know, create some other, you know, heat transfer path off the external, then, you know, the story changes, but sure. Uh, sure. That makes sense. Yeah. So the stand So, I mean, what, Oh, sorry. Go, no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, given that that I think anybody that thinks about this long enough will realize that the 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 data in that standard is not universally applicable, and given that some of those those specifications maybe defy intuition, what's the future of these standards? I mean, does the IPC have any plan or motivation to maybe more comprehensively address thermal management problems? Is, is there going to be a guideline for maybe developing a thermal model from your data? I think that would might be a bit more interesting, sort of like an analysis standard. Well, that's what I wanted to do. I, when I created all of this, this work and I had the software package, I went to IPC and I wanted to try and sell it through IPC along with the standard. But the economics just didn't work and I couldn't, couldn't make that all come together. But I thought it would have been a perfect combo, especially with training. I, I think that there needs to be more training, right? Uh, but we, there was just no funding for it, so we couldn't really move forward with any of it. You know, there was a great master plan, but we just couldn't pull it off in the few years that I had available to make that all happen. And, uh, you know, something that people need to realize is that uh, IPC really took over industry standards from the government back around 1995. And before IPC had these standards, all of this work was done by the National uh, Bureau of Standards. And there was, a, when I was at Hughes Aircraft Company, I remember the senior guys complaining about how it took forever to get something through the National Bureau of Standards. They wanted to make changes and You'd submit a form and you'd just wait for years before you'd get results. Well, now, and so in 1995, there was a thing called the Perry Act, and all of the, the military standards were turned over to the industries that used them. It was expensive. People were complaining about the National Bureau of Standards, so the government said, well, all right, you want to complain, you guys take it over and you manage them. 
And so IPC is really nothing more than all of us. You know, the industry is responsible for ourselves. We are responsible for ourselves. So, you, you know, is IPC, you know, doing anything? You got to go talk to the people that want to make change and bring that to them to make change. Uh, I couldn't make it work any more than... I, I felt good about getting as far as I got, and uh, I just couldn't, you know, carry it any further. Plus, it was all on one well, nickel. I, I, Lockheed wasn't paying my way they, because, you know, it was a conflict of interest because of my IP, and I was stuck. And so I... I eventually had to stop spending my own money to help the industry <laughs> and, and move on to other things. Well, it sounds like it's time to, to pass the torch maybe or, you know, pass on the knowledge at least and, you know, allow the next generation to maybe continue in your stead uh, for those who, who care a lot about thermal management because I know it's extremely important for high reli reliability designs. Um, but it's it's interesting because I think you go to a, a conference like, you know, like we just had Altium Live, or maybe you go to, um, you know, one of the other PCB conferences or DesignCon or something else. Um, and like thermal management is not high on the list of available presentations. It's a lot of signal and power integrity, which are important. Um, maybe it's a lot of HDI and then a lot of manufacturing, but like you're lucky if you see anything on thermal management. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's a lot of people that recognize that thermal management is important, though. And, you know, there's a guy, his name's Istvan Novak. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a signal integrity guy. And, yeah. and uh, he got... I believe he's actually been on the podcast as well. Oh, awesome. Well, yeah. I want to apologize to him. I, I told him that I would... Uh, so he asked me if I would submit a proposal to Oxford University to do a, a, a class and... Uh, I wanted to do it on IPC 2152. I sent a proposal to Oxford. They accepted it, but they said, well, could you make, instead of, a, they just wanted a one-day class. They said, instead of a one-day class, how about doing a two-day class and do a heat transfer, you know, thermal management on circuit boards one day and then, you know, do the IPC on the next day. So I submitted that. They accepted it. I started to put this and one of the questions to him was, so do you want death by, by PowerPoint or should we do some experiments and things like that? And he goes, yeah, we don't want death by PowerPoint. Let's do some experiments. And so uh, I had a, a bunch of stuff from the, when I started things at the University of Colorado in Denver, uh, we had some really cool setups for testing boards. And I was going to bring all of that. And I started pulling everything together and, my equipment's old. My laptop that has the data acquisition software was out of date. I couldn't get the software up. And I, I've got a rule of not spending any more money on this stuff. So I, I would have had to start calling people and begging for free copies. And I, it just didn't happen. So uh, I had to put it on, on hold. And I, I put that training you know, away also. And that was just a few years ago. But, you know, I think the key is to, to get some training, you know, and, and bring attention to it. Uh, there's a, the, the next generation has to be looking at things a little different, especially in the pre-design phase. You know, after you've got your board built, it's one thing. But then if you find problems, like, you know, associated with the traces, then you have to go do a respin on it. So the cost impacts. And then not only that, but, you know, if you have problems... Uh, you know, we had a, a satellite that was on a launch vehicle. Poor guys, somebody had shorted uh, one of the lines to the electronics when they were uh, doing some checkout. Ran too much current through one of the traces in one of the boards. And when they looked at the IPC, the 2221 charts, which is what they had at the time, you know, it was showing, you know, 400 degree C rise and they had most likely shorted it. And so they're going to have to pull this box off the spacecraft and look at it, inspect it. And then you'd have to run through qual all over again before you could put it back on the spacecraft. It would have cost months. They would have missed their launch date. But I was able to run a quick model, show that the temperature rise was nothing. And we, we saved just a ton of time and money.
And yeah, 400, 400 degrees versus nothing is a pretty big difference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think we're going to have to leave it at that because um, we're, we're running a little low on time. But, I mean, this is all extremely interesting. And, and if you're okay with it, we would like to link to your uh, your LinkedIn profile uh, in the show notes so that uh, anyone who's interested can maybe get in contact with you. Yeah, sure. I haven't, <laughs> I, I haven't done any updates to it. I just let it run. It, LinkedIn does a pretty good job of researching and reminding you to do things. I don't go and do those, but it, it is there. And, I'm, I welcome people to contact me. That's fine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I mean, I'm a, you know me, I'm a physics guy. This stuff is all extremely interesting to me. And I think it's also very important as, you know, high reliability designs uh, are becoming much more commonplace in areas like commercial space, electric vehicles. Uh, I think thermal uh, issues are going to come back in vogue, if you will. Well, you can't miss out on it. It's a big part of the design process and you can't ignore it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much again, Mike. Uh, Everybody check out the show notes to learn more about Mike's work. Um, We'll also have some great resources about thermal management and PCB design. And I think that's all for today. Uh, Everybody who's listening, don't stop learning and stay on track. 